So a lot of people are interested uh, about Q and what this, uh, where the notion of Q comes from. Um, scholars since uh, at least the end of the uh, 18th century uh, have been wondering about the relationship among the th first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And uh, uh, Mark's Gospel is, as I think everyone knows, the shortest about 666 verses. Um, Matthew is, uh, is longer by another 400 or so verses, and Luke just a little bit longer than that. The overlap among the three is, is such that it is very difficult to imagine that these are three independent um, accounts of the life of Jesus. There is not only a good deal of verbatim agreement either between two of them, Matthew and Mark, or Mark and Luke, uh, or sometimes among all three, but also sequential agreement. That is, they tell the same stories, they have the same sayings in the same relative order. And the combination of both uh, verbatim agreements and sequential agreements are, are of a nature that indicates to scholars that some kind of literary relationship exists among the three. Question is what is that? Uh, what is that literary relationship? I think it's fair to say that the, by far the large, largest majority of scholars who work on the, what's called the synoptic problem uh, agree that uh, Mark is the earliest of the three Gospels, and that Matthew and Luke have both used Mark, and that in part accounts for the. Uh, the sequential agreement, the rough sequential agreement that Matthew and Luke have, uh, agreeing with Mark and sequence, and it agrees, to, and it accounts in some some sense for the uh, agreements that they have in wording between uh, w with Mark. Um, now, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew and Luke, have another set of material that is not in Mark at all. Um, this is has been called the double tradition material. Uh, and what that means is it's, it's material that Matthew shares with Luke, but which Mark does not have. So if, um, uh, if Matthew and Luke in general got a lot of their material from Mark, then the question is, where did they get that double material from? Mark doesn't have it, so they didn't get it from Mark. Um, and there's, there's a couple of logical possibilities here. One logical possibility is that Matthew got it from Luke or Luke got it from Matthew. Uh, and another possibility is that each of them independently got, got that material from another source. And that source is what has been called Q, which simply um, stands for the German word Quelle, which means source. At present, the most commonly espoused solutions to the synoptic problem, I should say hypotheses, that offer solutions to this, uh, the synoptic problem are two. Um, the first is what is called the two-document hypothesis, which argues that Matthew and Luke used Mark's gospel and used that as a kind of skeleton for both of their gospels, and that Matthew and Luke independently used a second document, um, which let's call it Q, uh, and uh, that is where they obtained the double tradition material from. There's a lot of parables there. Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain is largely double tradition material and um, a number of other bits. It totals about, about 4,200 words of text. So that's the two doc document hypothesis. The other hypothesis is that Matthew used Mark, Luke used Mark, but that Luke used Matthew also, and that the so-called double tradition material uh, that Luke has is material that he got from Matthew and used that to supplement uh, what he had received from Mark. So both of those solutions are, I think, in broad um, description, logically possible. Um, uh, that is, there's nothing on, there's nothing impossible, logically impossible, about either of those. Now, in the study of the synoptic problem, uh, one moves from scenarios that are logically possible to 
scenarios that are editorially plausible. That is, can we understand Luke's procedure on the two document hypothesis uh, as a sensible procedure that does that is does the assumption of his use of mark and q uh, make sense when you look at the product that luke produces or that matthew produces and likewise when you look at the what's called the far hypothesis that is that luke uh, has used both mark and matthew uh, to produce his gospel uh, whereas Mark, uh, Matthew has used only Mark uh, and some extra material that he's, uh, that he's got from some other source to produce his gospel. Uh, does that make editorial sense? Um, so I think it's not a secret that I hold to the two document hypothesis. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, that positing a Q makes better sense of the results of, that are obtained by Matthew and Luke than to suggest that Luke has received the double tradition material from Matthew. Um, and my reason for, uh, for not espousing that second position uh, is that it, if I were to hold it, it would require me to assume what I think is um, a, an implausible level of literary inventiveness and uh, editorial um, uh, transformations on the part of Luke. So in the study of the synoptic problem, as I conceive it, uh, one moves from, editorial scenar uh, from scenarios that are logically possible to editorial scenarios that are editorial editorially plausible that is where we can uh, th where we think we can understand how Matthew and Luke uh, worked as editors assuming the sources that respective hypotheses uh, uh, suggest that they had so to think about the current complexion of Matthew and Luke seems to me to make sense if we imagine Matthew and Luke independently using Mark, uh, and they, chain, they, they take over some of Mark, they alter Mark. They tend to alter Mark in different ways when they alter Mark, which, is, which would suggest that one has not seen the, the alterations of the other. And when they take over the Q material, the double tradition material, saying Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, number of parables, and so forth, they tend to uh, place it differently relative to the Markan framework. So the illustration that I use with my students is, imagine that you've got a narrative account of, let's say, the life of Socrates, and you've got a collection of sayings of Socrates. Um, and I, I give these two packages of information to all 42 of my undergraduate students and ask them to produce a single story of Socrates. In all likelihood, unless there's collaboration, uh, we will get 42 different accounts because each of my students will make different editorial judgments about where to plug this saying into the narrative for America and where to plug that saying. And so we will end up with very different accounts. If there's collaboration amongst the students, we'll be able to see that because they will have made identical editorial decisions about where to put this saying in uh, in relationship to this narrative uh, event. Now that seems to me the situation that we have in Matthew and Luke. They agree on the Markan framework but they make very different decisions about where to put the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, where to put the woes against the Pharisees, uh, where to put the parable of the entrusted money, they, they place these in different places relative to the, to the mark and sequence. That would su suggest to me that Matthew and Luke work independently with their two sources. Now the other view, the Griesbeck, the, um, I'm sorry, the Farr hypothesis that um, assumes that Luke has direct access to Matthew and gets the double tradition from Matthew, that has to explain then this peculiar feature that is that 
Luke tends to make different editorial choices of the positioning of the so-called Q or double tradition material relative to the Markan framework. In fact, and does so pretty consistently. Now, it's certainly not impossible to imagine an author doing this, that is, fairly consistently dislocating from its Mathean location a saying and sticking it somewhere else. But then, I think as a literary scholar, one needs to explain why Luke would do this. It's, you're going to an awful lot of trouble to systematically dislocate Q sayings or double tradition sayings from their Mathean location. Um, uh, why not take over Matthew's location at, at points? There seems to me nothing wrong with it. Um, now, the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the responses to this objection is, well, perhaps Luke came to know Mark much earlier than he came to know Matthew. And so Mark was already kind of set in his head um, uh, before, he, uh, before he got this second, this second source. And since um, Mark's sequence and Matthew's sequence uh, agree pretty strongly, when he came to a, 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 Q, a double tradition saying that occurs in one Mathean context, he decided, let me just collect all of those extra Markan sayings from Matthew and stick them, uh, let's say, starting at the in chapter six and another block starting in the cha in chapter nine and so forth. I guess that's that that's not an that's not a theoretically impossible scenario to imagine. But it seems to me, as a literary explanation, it's it makes much more sense of the data to say Matthew and Luke are working with their two sources independently, and of course that means they're going to come up with two different combinations of those, of those two sources. Uh, that's the two-document hypothesis. So in terms of the kind of ease and efficiency of uh, a literary explanation or an editorial explanation, it seems to me that the, uh, the two-document hypothesis is simpler uh, because it doesn't have to posit that Luke systematically dislocates double tradition sayings from their Mathean location and, all, and always places them, them somewhere else. When you do that, then you have to explain why does Luke decide to do that? Why does he decide to move this saying from here to here? Um, uh, now, if you're smart enough, uh, and a number of the people who work in that uh, with the far hypothesis are extremely clever people, uh, then you can come up with uh, a possible explanation, um, uh, but it, uh, in the, at the end of the day, it comes comes down for me to whose explanation seems uh, more plausible given what we know about ancient editorial habits, um, which tended to be pretty conservative. Editors just tended to work with documents as they got them rather than engage in massive reorganization of those documents. So it comes down to a kind of probability argument for me that the two-document hypothesis, I think, makes better sense um, of the state of the Gospels than the far hypothesis. And that leaves me then with having to posit a Q, um, which turns out to have its own literary integrity and uh, uh, own literary genre. It's a sayings collection uh, rather than a narrative life of Jesus. Uh, and it has some distinctive uh, theological emphases in it uh, that are independent of uh, Mark, certainly, and it actually even independent of the editorial interests of Matthew and Luke.